the challenge is like, well, shit, I didn't sign up for this. Like, I wanted to do AI research. I didn't want to do like AI research plus societal ethics and geopolitics. That's also not my expertise. I think that's a very reasonable point. Unfortunately, there isn't like another crap team of people hiding behind some wall to entirely shoulder the burden of this. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show where we learn about making machine learning models work in the real world. I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Jack Clark is the Strategy and Communications Director at OpenAI. Before that, he was the world's only neural network reporter at Bloomberg. He's also one of the smartest people I know thinking about policy and AI and ethics. I really am excited to talk to him. I feel like I typically get nervous when people ask me like, you know, kind of big policy questions about AI. And I I, I never really feel like I have much um, smart to say. And I think the goal of this podcast is mainly to talk about, you know, people doing AI in production. But then when I started writing down questions I want to ask you, I was like, wait a second, like, I want to ask you all the policy questions and all the, the weird questions that, that everyone asked me because I have no idea. And um, I like, ser- so the next question I seriously want to know, because I feel like you think about this a lot. I mean, this is such a cliche question, but I'm, I'm like actually fascinated by how you're going to answer it, which is what what probability do you put on like AI apocalypse? Oh, good. So we'll start with the really easy question and go from there. I like yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's, what, what's your yeah. like, is it like one in 10, like nine out of 10, uh, one in a million? Like, what are you, what's um, your, what's your I odds? I think the chance of an AI apocalypse is, is quite high. It's like above 50%, but that's only because the chance of most apocalypses, if they get to the point that they're happening, like say uh-huh. a global pandemic, which is something that we're currently going through, it's quite clear that most of today's governments don't have the capacity or capabilities to deal with these really hard challenges. So if you end up in some scenario where you've got like large autonomous broken machines doing bad stuff, then uh-huh. I think your chance of being able to like write the chip, write the <laughs> ship is like relatively low. Um, and you don't have like a super positive sort of outlook. Uh-huh. I think the chance that we have to like avert that and get ahead of it is actually quite high. Um, but I think your question is more like, if 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 something like wakes up and we enter this very, very weird territory, what are our chances? And I think if we don't do anything today, then our chances are extremely poor. No, well, okay, so yeah, I, I think maybe I agree. Our chances of surviving an AI apocalypse are probably low. But I yeah. think my, my question actually is, is, what do you think the chances are of like actually entering the AI apocalypse? And remember that all apocalypse scenarios yeah, they they can't sum to more than one, right? So, mm-hmm. like, I mean, in a way, like the like a pandemic apocalypse, like unless you think they're sort of like linked, that that should make the AI apocalypse oh, probably actually lower, yeah. right? I think that there's, I mean, this is kind of like at the beginning of when you started to do massive amounts of computer trading on the stock market, saying what's the chance we're going to enter into a, a high frequency trading apocalypse. And I think how someone would have answered that is, it's really high, we'll have problems, but it's fairly unlikely that the whole system will topple over due to high frequency trading. And I think that my answer on AI is is pretty similar. Like it's really high, but we're going to have some problems because Uh it's it's a massively scaled technology that does weird things really, really, really quickly. And we'll do stuff in areas where where finance has also deployed huge amounts of capital. So the opportunity for big things going wrong is kind of high. But the Uh chance of a total apocalypse feels a little fantastical to me. Um, And that's partly because I think for a real apocalypse, like a really bad, severe one, you Uh need the ability for AI to take a lot of actions in the world, which means you need robotics. And robotics, as you and I both know, is terrible and actually protects us from a huge amount of many parts of the like or next apocalypse scenarios. I, the way that I think about this is you develop a load of radical technology and and some of the greatest risks you face aren't the technology deciding of its own volition to do bad stuff. That very rarely happens, it, it's even unlikely here. There's a chance that you kind of get black mold with technology. Like somewhere in your house, you have not been cleaning it efficiently and you don't have good systems in place, 
and something problematic starts developing in a kind of emergent way that you barely notice. But that thing has really adverse effects on you. And it's also hard to diagnose the source of the problem and why it's occurring. Interesting. So, but okay, so that's actually like a little bit less of a, that seems like a much more concrete scenario. Like, I guess what, mm -hmm. um, what form might that take? I mean, it sounds like you're, you're mostly worried about sort of the things we're doing now. We get, we get better at doing these bad things and that, that causes big problems. Like what, what, what are like top of mind as, as like concerns for you? Yeah. Well, I, I guess I'd frame my concern as we're currently pretty blind to most of the places this could show up. And we kind of need something that looks a lot like weather forecasting and, you know, radar and sensors for, for looking at evolutions in, in this domain. The sorts of things that I'd be worried about are scaled up versions of what we already have. Recommendation systems pushing people towards kind of increasingly odd areas of sort of content or subject matter that we aren't realizing are quietly radicalizing people or making people behave differently with each other. I worry quite a lot about sort of AI capabilities interacting with economics. So you have some economic incentive today to create entertaining disinformation or misinformation. I think we think about what happens when, when those things collide. You have good AI tools for creating misinformation or disinformation and an economic incentive and stuff starts showing up. I think there are going to be relatively few grand evil plans. I think there are going to be lots and lots of like accidental screw ups that happen at really, really large scales and that happen really, really quickly with self reinforcing cycles. And I think that that's the challenge is, is you not only need to spot something, but you're going to need to take actions quite quickly. And that's something that we're traditionally just really, really bad at doing as people. Like we can we can observe bad things happening, but our ability to act against them is, is quite low. But you, I mean, so you, you do like a lot of work on like ethics and AI mm -hmm. and a lot of kind of thinking about it, but it sort of seems like those scenarios sort of feel, is like, is AI special there? Like it seems like there's kind of a lot, that might be like, just sort of general technology risk, right? Do you, do you think AI makes it sort of different? I think the difference is delegation. So like technology allows us to delegate certain things. Technology up until many sort of practical forms of AI lets us delegate highly specific things that we can write down in a, in a sort of procedural way. And AI allows us to delegate things which have a bit more inherent freedom in how you choose to approach the problem that's been delegated to you. Like, you know, make sure people watch more videos on my website. It's kind of a fuzzy problem. You, you're giving a larger space for the system to sort of think about it. And so I think the ethics there, they're, they're not something that humans haven't encountered before, but it's a form of ethics, which is kind of has a lot in common with the military or how you do administrative states in the old days, which is the sort of ethical nature of giving someone the ability to delegate increasingly broad tasks to hundreds or thousands of capable people. That's like a classic ethical problem that people have dealt with for hundreds or thousands of years. But with AI, now almost everyone gets to do that delegation. And that really hasn't happened before. We haven't had this scale of delegation and this ease with which people can kind of scale themselves up. And so lots of the ethical challenges are like, okay, People now have much greater capabilities to do like good and harm than they did before. They have these automated tools that kind of extend their ability to do this. How do you think about the role of the tool developer in that context? Because sure, you're building just like iterations on previous tools, but the, the scope of which those tools will be used, the areas in which they'll be used is much, much broader than you've, you've sort of dealt with before. And I think it introduces ethical considerations for you that maybe governments only previously dealt with. I see. So so in your view, AI kind of allows like single individuals to to have sort of broader impact. Yeah. And therefore have, the, the tools that you actually make available to folks, uh, there's there's more ethical issues within that. Yeah. Like a good way to think about this is um I think language models are interesting. Here's an ethical challenge that I find interesting with language models. You have a big language model that has a generative capability. You want to give that to basically everyone because it's, it's sort of analogous to a, a new form of paintbrush. It's, it's very general. People are going to do all kinds of stuff with it. 
except uh, this paintbrush reflects um, the implicit biases in the sort of data that it was trained on at massive scale. So, okay, it's like a slightly racist paintbrush. The problem is now different to just having a paintbrush. You've got like a paintbrush that has slight tendencies and some of these tendencies seem fine to you, but some of the tendencies seem to reflect things that, that many people have a, a strong moral view of as being like bad and in society. What do you do then? And I've actually spoken to lots and lots of artists about this and most artists will just say, give me the paintbrush. Like I want the like crazy funhouse mirror version of society so I can talk about it and make interesting things. That feels fine. But then I wonder about what happens if, if someone gets given this paintbrush and they just want to write text for a kind of economic purpose. They may not know much about the paintbrush they've been given. They may not know about its traits. And then suddenly they're kind of unwittingly creating massive scaled up versions of the biases inherent to that thing you gave them. But that seems challenging. And, and where like we as the technology developers have a lot of choice, a sort of uncomfortable amount of choice, and a lot of problems which are not easy to like fix. Like you can't fix this. You need to sort of figure out how to talk about it and make people aware of it. Well, that's a really clever analogy. I've not not heard that one before. Yeah, I mean, I think for, I think it speaks to the weird scalability of a lot of this stuff. Like, if we just have tools that let people scale themselves in in various directions, and the directions are increasingly creative areas because we're building these you know, scaled up curve fitting systems that can fit really weird curves, including in like interesting semantic domains. Then all the problems of like curve fitting now become weird problems of like the production of, of, of art and sort of thought, which feels different and challenging. I don't have great answers here. I have more like, oh dear, this is interesting and, and feels like different. But actually, I mean, it's interesting because the like the, the, you know, you speak of the sort of like language model as, oh, like, you know, just for example, like what if you had a language model? But mm -hmm. I mean, like OpenAI actually like had this issue. Yeah. And I'm curious, like how you thought about it at the time and how you reflect on that now. I think at the time, so this is GPT-2, which is a language model that we announced and, and didn't initially release, but subsequently released in full. At the time, we, I think we made a kind of classic error which is that if you're developing a technology, you see all of its potential um, very, very clearly. And you don't just see the technology you're holding in your hands, you see Gen 2, 3, 4, and 5, and the implications thereof. I think we treated some of our worries about the misuse of this technology. We were thinking about later versions of the technology than the one we were actually holding. Because what actually happened is we released it we observed a huge amount of positive uses and really surprising ones like this game AI Dungeon, where a language model becomes a kind of dungeon master. And, and it feels like interesting and actually different, like a different form of game playing, something we wouldn't have expected. And the misuses were relatively small. And it's actually been because it's really hard to make a misuse of a technology. It's probably as hard to make a misuse of a technology as it is to make a positive use. And luckily, most people want to do the positive uses. So your, your amount of people doing the misuses is a lot smaller. I think that means that the responsibility of technology developers is going to be more about maybe you're still going to kind of trickle things out in stages, but you're ultimately going to, going to kind of release lots of stuff in some form. It's about thinking about how you can control some elements of the technology while making other parts accessible. Like, can you control how you, you'd expect a big generative system to be used while making it maximally accessible. Because you definitely don't want like uh, a big generative model that may have biased tendencies providing generations to people in say a mock interview process that happens before they speak to a human for an interview stage. Because that's the sort of usage that we can imagine and feels like the sort of thing you really want to avoid but you can sort of imagine ways in which you'd make this technology really, really, really broadly accessible while finding ways to carve out parts where you as a developer kind of say this, this probably isn't okay. So I think our, our thinking's become a lot more subtle. And I think we did, we did anchor on the future more than the present. And that's been one of the main things that's changed. Interesting. So knowing what you know now, you, you wouldn't 
withhold the model? I think you'd still do staged release, but I think that you'd do more research earlier on characterizing the biases of the model and potential malicious uses. Because the thing that we did is we did some of this research and then we did a lot more after some of the initial models have been released on characterizing subsequent models we are planning to release. What I think is now more helpful is if you you have a load of that stuff front loaded. So you're basically saying, here's the context, here are the traits of this thing, which is like going to slowly be released and you should be aware of it. Um, so yeah, I think we would have done stuff slightly differently. And I think that this is, what we're, what we're trying to do here is, is learn how to behave with these technologies. And some of that is about making yourself like more culpable than is traditional for its outcomes. Because as a thinking exercise, it makes you think about different things to do. Um, so I'm glad that part of the goal with GPT-2 is bring a problem that we actually don't get to get wrong in the future earlier in time to a point where we can like do different ways of release and you know maybe some of them will be good and some of them will be suboptimal and learn from that. Because I think in five, six, seven years, these sorts of capabilities will need to be treated in a sort of like standardized way that we thought about carefully and getting to that requires lots of experiments now. But it's kind of interesting. I guess there's sort of two kinds of problems. Like I, I think my understanding of the the worry with GPT-2 is actually malicious uses, mm -hmm. which like more information probably wouldn't help with. But then there's also, I think like, you know, your idea of like a uh, accidentally racist paintbrush. Yeah. Um, like that sort of speaks to like inadvertently bad uses. I mean, b both seem like potential issues, but do you now view malicious uses as, as kind of less of an issue? Cause I really could imagine like a very good language model having plenty of malicious uses. And I suppose you could say, well, any interesting technology probably has yeah. malicious uses. So should we never release like any kind of tool? Like how, how do you think about that? Yeah. Again, it's good that we're doing really easy questions. I'm glad that we're slowly <laughs> warming up the, the easy stuff. Um, well, look, there's, there's a couple of things. One other thing we did with GPT-2 was we released a detector system, um, which was a model trained to detect outputs of GPT-2 models. We also released a big data set of unsupervised generations from the model so other people could build different detector systems. I think that a huge amount of dealing with misuse is just giving yourself awareness, you know, like why are, why are police forces around the world and security services able to actually deal with organized crime? Well, we can't make organized crime go away because that's a socioeconomic phenomenon, but they can like tool up on very specific ways to detect patterns of organized crime. And I think it's similar here where you need to release tools that can help others detect the outputs of the things you're releasing. Um, for avoiding malicious uses, I think it's, it's actually kind of challenging. I think that it's a little unclear today how you completely rule that stuff out. I think it's generally challenging to do that with, with sort of technologies. Some of how we've been approaching it is trying to make prototypes. The idea being, if we can make like a prototype use case that's malicious and real, then we should sort of talk to affected people. Um, the extent to which we would publicize that remains deeply unclear to me because as, as you kind of in, sort of intuit, if you publicize malicious uses, it's like, look over here, here's how you might misuse this thing we've released, which seems, seems a little dangerous. Um, I think that we're going to need new forms of, of control of technology in general at some point. I don't think that's like this year's problem or next year's problem, but you know, in 2025, you're going to have these like embarrassingly capable cognitive services, which can be made available to large numbers of people. And I think sort of cloud providers and governments and others are going to need to work together to really characterize what can be just generically available for everyone and what needs some level of like care and attention paid to it. And getting to that's going to be uh, incredibly unpleasant and difficult, but, but feels kind of inevitable. But I guess just to um, to be concrete, like if you created, say, like a GPT-3 that was much mm -hmm. more powerful, you think that you would probably release it along with the detector would be the sort of compromise now? Or? I think you think about different ways that you can release it because like some capabilities might be fine, some might 
you know, you might want to have some sort of control. So you control the model that people access sort of services around it. That could be one way that you do it. Another way could be just releasing fine tuned versions of models on specific data sets or specific areas, because if you fine tune a model, it's kind of like neural silly putty, where you take this big blob of like capability, you put it on a new data set, it takes on sort of the traits of that data set. And, and in some sense, you've restricted it. So you can do things like that. I think the challenge for a lot of developers going forward is going to be in how to deal with the root, like artifacts themselves, like the models themselves. Like here, here's a thing I think about quite regularly is it's, it's not today, it's not next year, it's probably not even 2022, but, but definitely by like 2025, we're going to have conditional video models. Like someone in the AI community or, or some group of people are going to develop research that allows us to generate a model, generate a video that runs for some period of time, you know, a few seconds, probably, probably not like minutes, but they can guide it so that it includes specific people and they do specific things. And maybe you also get audio um, as well. That capability is obviously something that it's, it's like a much harder case of just a language model or just an image model. I think that that capability definitely gets like quite a few controls applied to it and needs systems done for like authentication of real content on, on the public internet as well. Like it provokes questions about that. Yeah, I think we're heading we're heading into a weird era for all of this stuff. I just I, I think that the advantages you get of releasing all of this stuff just sort of publicly on the internet are pretty huge. But I also think that it's like to some degree a dereliction of duty by the AI community to not think about the implications of where we are in three, four, five years, because I, I, I have quite a high confidence that we, we can't be in this state of affairs where the norm is to like Put everything online instantly um, because I think I think we'll just develop things that are frankly like too capable. And by we, I mean AI researchers writ large. For you to be able to do that and say this is fine. Do you think what that? Do you um... think? I need to ask. I want to ask you about this. Like, what do you think <laughs> about this sort, of, this sort of issue? Like, what is the responsibility of sort of technologists, and, and and how do we get to a more responsible place? And is that even necessary? And then you could ask me another question for that. I got that. Ooh. I don't know. I, it's funny. I, I feel like I really want the want to reserve the right to change my mind on some of this stuff. Like I feel like so do I. Um, to be clear, <laughs> I would quite like the right to reserve. I didn't realize we were committing in this conversation, but let's let's no, I don't, I both just, get to the side. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I, I think I'm like kind of reluctant to like say things publicly because I, um, you know the. It seems like actually the ethics really depend on sort of the the specifics of the, um, mm -hmm. you know how the technology works and stuff. And I think like, you know, I think like on GPT two is like for just as an example, it seemed like, you know, I thought OpenAI's decision was intriguing and like different than I think what I would have done or what my instincts mm -hmm. would have been. Um, but it was kind of like provocative to say, hey, we're not going to you know release this model. Um, and I think, you know, I think the good thing about it maybe was it kind of got everyone kind of like talking and, and, and thinking about mm -hmm. it. I guess also another thing that I don't really have a strong point of view on, but just seems like a little interesting is it seems like every, um, it seems like at the moment, every AI researcher is sort of asked to be like their own kind of ethicist, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, on this stuff. Like I see like a lot of like, you know, ethics documents coming out with, um, you know, like even like open source, you know, ML projects mm -hmm. will sort of have like their their code of conduct. And on one hand, it seems a little um, it seems a little almost like highfalutin to me. Like, I feel like I have this instinct mm -hmm. of like, come on, like, you know, like, you know, should I like put out like a code of ethics with like, you know, like the toaster that I sell or, you know, it seems a yeah. little there's something that seems a little like unappealing about it. But I, I could actually also definitely articulate the other side of it that if you think I guess to me, like it's less like the the power of an individual or, and more of just like sort of like if this technology can kind of compound and like you know run amok then um you know maybe it's a case that you know people really should be thinking about it but uh yeah i just honestly like i don't know and i, I don't even know i guess i'm curious what you think about this because you're like in this all the time 
Do you think that AI researchers are in the best position to um, decide this stuff? I mean, if it if it really affects society as profoundly as you're saying, it seems like kind of everyone should should get a say about how this stuff works, right? Yeah. So this is unfair, right? What, what's actually happening here is an unfair thing for AI researchers, which is that they are building powerful technologies. They're releasing them into a world that doesn't have any real notion of technology governance um, because it hasn't really been developed yet. And they're releasing them into systems that will use the technologies to do great amounts of good and, and maybe a small amount of harm. And so the, the challenge is like, well, shit, I didn't sign up for this. Like, I wanted to do AI research. I didn't want to do, like, AI research plus societal ethics and geopolitics. That's also not my expertise. I think that's a very reasonable point. Unfortunately, there isn't, like, another crack team of people hiding behind some wall to entirely shoulder the burden of this. There are ethicists and social scientists and philosophers, members of the public, governments, all of them, have thoughts about this and should be involved. But I think the way to view AI researchers is they're making stuff that's kind of important. They should view themselves as being analogous to engineers of like the people who build buildings and make sure bridges don't fall over, who have a notion of ethics. Chemists who have a notion of ethics because chemists get trained how to make bombs. And so you kind of want your chemists to have a strong ethical compass so that most of them don't make explosives because until you have a really, really resilient and stable society. You don't want lots of people able to do this who have sort of no ethical grounding because they might do experiments that lead to literal blow-ups. Um, or even, you know, people like lawyers who have codes of conduct and ethics. It's very strange to look at AI research and sort of more broadly computer science and see a relative lack of this when you see it in other disciplines that are as impactful or maybe even less impactful on our current world. Um, I don't think any AI researcher is going to solve this on their own, but I think that a culture of culpability, of thinking that actually to some extent I am like a little responsible here, not, not a lot, it's not my entire problem, but I have some responsibility is good because how you get systemic change is, you know, millions of people making very small decisions of their own lives. It's not like millions of people making huge apocryphal decisions because that doesn't happen at scale. But millions of people making like slight deltas is how you get massive change over time. And I think that's kind of what we need here. Hi, we'd love to take a moment to tell you guys about Weights and Biases. Weights and Biases is a tool that helps you track and visualize every detail of your machine learning models. We help you debug your machine learning models in real time, collaborate easily, and advance the state of the art in machine learning. You can integrate weights and biases into your models with just a few lines of code. With hyperparameter sweeps, you can find the best set of hyperparameters for your models automatically. You can also track and compare how many GPU resources your models are using. With one line of code, you can visualize model predictions in form of images, videos, audio, plotly charts, molecular data, segmentation maps, and 3D point clouds. You can save everything you need to reproduce your models days, weeks, or even months after training. Finally, with reports, you can make your models come alive. Reports are like blog posts in which your readers can interact with your model metrics and predictions. Reports serve as a centralized repository of metrics, predictions, hyperparameter stride, and accompanying notes. All of this together gives you a bird's eye view of your machine learning workflow. You can use reports to share your model insights, keep your team on the same page and collaborate effectively remotely. I'll leave a link in the show notes below to help you get started. And now let's get back to the episode. Well, let me ask you another easy question. Cool. What, Good. Do, you... Yeah. <laughs> what do you think about <laughs> um, military applications of AI? I think that, well, the military applications of AI aren't special in the sense that it's technology that's going to be used kind of generically in different domains, so it'll get used in military applications. I mostly don't like it 
because of sort of what I think of as the like AK-47 problem. So, you know, the AK-47 was a technological innovation to make this type of rifle like more repeatable, uh, more maintainable and easier to use by people who had much less knowledge of weaponry than, than, than many prior systems. You develop this system, it goes everywhere. It makes the act of like taking life or, or, or carrying out war cheaper and more repeatable, just massively cheaper and, and much more repeatable. Um, and so we see a rise in, in conflict. And we also see that this artifact, this technical artifact, to some extent, like drives conflict. It doesn't create the conditions for conflict, but it gets injected into them and it, cre and it worsens them because it's cheap and it works. And I think that AI, if applied sort of wrongly or rashly in a military context, does a lot of this. Um, it makes certain things cheaper, certain things more repeatable, and seems really, really bad. I think AI for military awareness is much more of a kind of gray area. Like lots of the uh, some ways in which unsteady peace sort of holds in the world is by different sides who, who are at war with each other having lots of awareness of each other, awareness of troop movements, distributions, what you're doing. And they use surveillance technologies to do this. And I think you can make a credible argument that the, the advances in computer vision that we're seeing that's being applied like massively widely may, if a if adopted at scale by lots of militaries at the same time, which is kind of what seems to be happening, may provide some some diminishment on a certain type of conflict because it means there's generally more awareness. Um, I think stuff like the moral question of lethal autonomous weapons is really, really challenging because we want it to be a moral question, but it's ultimately going to be an economic question. Like, it's going to be a question that, that governments make decisions about on the motivation of like economic speed of decision and what it does to strategic advantage, which means it's really hard to reason about because neither you or I make these decisions and actually come at it with like a radically different frame, probably of like a strong intuitive push against from it existing, but that's not the frame that these people have. Right, right. Let's do so another easy more? question. What else you got? <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, actually, I, okay, this is maybe like a less, um, a less loaded question, but I'm, I'm kind yeah. of, I'm actually like genuinely curious about this. So, um, you know, you, you recently put out this paper, I think it's called towards trustworthy AI development. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I thought the, um, you know, as someone who builds a system that does a lot of saving of experiments and models and things like yeah, that, yeah. I thought it was really intriguing that you picked as like the subtitle, uh, mechanisms for supporting verifiable claims. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like you draw this incredibly bright, like direct line between, um, you know, trustworthy AI development and supporting verifiable claims. And I was wondering if you could sort of um, mm -hmm. tell me why that 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 is so connected. Well, it's it's really easy for us to say things that have a moral or an ethical kind of value and in words commit an organization to something like we we value you know, the safety of our systems and we value them not making, you know, biased decisions or, or what have you. But that's an aspiration. And it's very similar to a politician on the election campaign trail being like, well, if you elect me, I will do such and such for you. I'll give you all this money or I'll like, I'll build this thing. But it's not very verifiable. Like you're sort of needing to believe the organization or believe the politician and they can't give much proof to you because AI is going to be really, really significant in society and is going to play an increasingly large role, people are going to approach it with slightly more skepticism, just as they do with anything else in their life that plays a like, large role and, and has effects on them. And they're going to want systems of recourse, systems of diagnosis, systems of sort of awareness about it. Now, today, for most of this, we just fall back on people. We fall back on like the court system, you know, as a way to like, ensure stuff's verifiable. We have these mechanisms in the law that mean that if I as a company make a certain claim, you know, especially one that has a fiduciary component, uh, the, the sort of validation of that claim comes from a load of stuff around my company and the ability to verify it comes from action and also legal recourse if I'm not doing it. 
it's tons of stuff like that. But I guess like what, but just to before, yeah. I feel like you like just because some people will not have yeah. read the paper or listening to this. So like yeah. when you say like supporting verifiable claims, like what's an example of like a claim that you might want to verify that yeah. would be relevant to trustworthy AI development? A uh, claim you might want to verify is that uh, say our system is, we feel that we've like identified sort of many of the main biases in our system and have labeled it as such. However, you know, we, we want the world to sort of validate that our system lacks bias in a critical area. So we're going to use a mechanism, a bias bounty to get people to compete, to try and find bias traits in our system. And so there you've got a thing, you're making a claim about it. I believe that it's, you know, relatively unbiased or I've taken steps to, to log the bias in it. But then you're introducing an additional thing, which is a sort of transparent mechanism for other people to go and poke holes in your system and find biases in it. And that's going to make your claim more verifiable over time. And if it turns out that your system had some like huge trait that you hadn't spotted, well, at least the mechanism helps you identify it and then you're going to iterate from there. Similarly, we think about the creation of like third party auditing organizations, right? So there's, you could have an additional step. You could have, I have a system making some claim about bias, putting a bias bounty out there so I have more people like hitting my system. But if I'm being deployed in a, in a critical area, and what I mean by critical is, you know, a system that makes decisions that affect someone's financial life. So, you know, any, any of these areas that policymakers really, really care about, then I can say, okay, my system will be audited by a third party when it gets used in these areas. And so now, like, I'm really not asking you to, to believe me. I'm asking you to believe, like, the results of my public bounty and the results of this third party auditor. And I think that all of this stuff kind of stacks on itself and gives us the ability to have, to have kind of trust in systems. Other things might be, I will just, you know, I will make a claim about how I value privacy, but the mechanism by which I will be training my models and aggregating data will be using sort of encrypted machine learning techniques. So there I've got this claim, but you can really verify it because I have an auditable system that shows you how I'm sort of preserving your privacy while, while manipulating your data. And so the idea of this report is basically produce a load of mechanisms that we and a bunch of other organizations and people think are quite good and then the goal over the next year or two is to have organizations who are involved in the report and others who weren't implement some of these mechanisms and try them out. And we'll be trying to do this with, a, with at least a couple of them. Oh, cool. So I can join the red team to... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm to really excited about red team. <laughs> I think, like, so obviously having a... We recommend a shared red team. Um, that takes a little bit of unpacking because obviously if you're two proprietary companies, your red teams can't share lots and lots of information about your proprietary products, but they can share the methods they use to like red team AI systems and they can standardize on some of those sort of best practices. That kind of thing feels really, really useful because eventually you're going to want to make claims that you've red teamed the system and it's going to be easier to make a trustworthy claim if you use a kind of industry standard set of techniques that are well documented and many have done, but if you just sort of cowboy it and do it yourself. So yeah, please join the red team. We want lots of people on like some shared red team infrastructure eventually. But the red team infrastructure is actually, it seems like the way you describe it, and I'm sure this comes from security, but I just, I'm not yeah. super familiar with the field. It's like you have someone like internal to your organization, right? Like you, mm -hmm. you have an internal team that, that tries to break or tries to find yeah. problems with, you have that, and then you're seeking to find ways to have your internal team share insights with other people at other organizations. Now, they can't say, here's the proprietary system I broke and what I did. But they can say, when I like sit down and crack my knuckles and try and like red team an ML system, here are the approaches I use and here's what's effective. Uh, we, not in red teaming, but we have actually done a little bit of this at OpenAI where in a GPT-2 research paper, we wrote about some of the ways we tried to probe the model for biases, because we think that this is an area that's generally useful to, especially useful to get standards on. And then since then, we have just been emailing our methodology to like lots of people at other companies. 
these people can't tell us about the models that they're testing for bias, but they can look at the like probes we're suggesting and tell us if they seem sensible. And so that shows you how we're like able to develop some shared knowledge without without breaking sort of proprietary stuff. Interesting. Do you, one thing I kept kind of thinking as I was as I was as I was reading your paper is like I use all kinds of technology that um, I don't think has made verifiable claims. Like I mean, I feel like I rely on you know all all kinds of things to work. Yeah. And maybe they're making claims, but I'm certainly like not aware. <laughs> aware. Like I, I sort of assume yeah. that internet security works. I assume that um, you know I now have like all these things plugged into my home network that could mm-hmm. yeah. You know, but I, I just sort of, um, what do you think that um, it sort of seemed like these might be just sort of best practices for developing any kind of technology, or do you think there's something like really AI specific within it? And where would you even like draw the line where you would sort of call something um, AI that sort of needs this kind of treatment? I think some of it comes down to the so, so where do, where do you draw the line? I think AI stuff is basically when you cross from a technology that can easily be sort of audited and analyzed and have the scope of its behavior defined to a technology where you can somewhat audit and analyze it and sort of list out where it'll do well, but you can't fully define its scope. And I think that a lot of like, just sort of once you train a neural net, you have this like big, like probabilistic system that will mostly do certain things, but it actually has a surface area that's inherently hard to characterize fully. It's very, very, very difficult to like fully list it out. And and mostly it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to because only a sort of subset of the area, the surface area of your system is actually going to be used at any one time. So it does have some kind of differences. Or, you know, bias bounties, right, is a kind of weird thing. It's sort of equivalent to saying, all right, before we elect this like mayor or before we appoint this person to an administrative position we want a load of people to ask them a ton of different questions about quite abstract values that they may or may not have uh, because we want to feel confident that they reflect the values that we'd like someone to have in that position that feels different actually it feels a little different to like normal technologies um it would be absurd to expect we get to a world where everyone verifies every claim they make all the time because who has the time? You know, I mostly go through my life depending on, on my own belief that other people are sticking to the rules of the game. But we all have some cases where we want to go in on something that's happening in our life and audit every single facet of this. And I think the way to think about why you need verifiable claims or an ability to make them quite broadly is as governments consider how to sort of govern technology and how to let technology do the most good while minimizing the the harm, it's probably going to come down to the ability to verify certain things in certain critical situations. So you're kind of building all of this stuff, not for the majority of your life, but for the really narrow edge cases where this has to happen. Uh, But necessarily that means you need to build quite general tools for verification and then try and apply them in specific areas. It's interesting that, well, I don't know, it seems like there's been a lot of sort of complaining about AI research recently that a lot of the, just the research claims, which are maybe not so loaded and not so Mm -hmm. applied and we don't interact with, are actually not uh, really verifiable. Yeah, I mean, some of these things are just because there is a compute gap. There is like a minority of organizations with a large amount of compute. There is a majority of organizations and a huge swath of academia, if not all of academia, that has very real computational limits. And this means that at a really high level, you can't really validate claims made by a subset of the industry because they're doing experiments at at scales which you can't hope to meet. So some of this is about what, what are really general tools we can create to just resolve some of these kind of asymmetries of information. Because some some issues of verifiability are less about your ability to verify a specific thing in that moment. It's more about having enough kind of cultural understanding of where the other person is coming from that you kind of understand what they're saying and the premise behind it and can trust them, which is less you demanding a certain type of verification, but being like, okay, well, you know, you're a complete alien to me. You come from another cultural context or another 
you know, political ideology. However, we have this sort of strong shared understanding of, of this one thing that you're trying to get me to believe you about. And right now, if like certain organizations wanted to motivate academia to do a certain type of research, it would depend on, I come from this like big compute premise land, and I'm asking you to hear me when I list out a concern that only really makes sense if you've done like experimentation at my scale, because that's calibrated my intuitions. So we need to find a way to give these people the ability to have the same conversation so that you can sort of improve that stuff as well. So are you going to give them a ton of compute? Like what's your, uh, what's your solution? Well, we, we basically specifically recommend that they, that governments fund cloud computing, which is a bit different to, it's, it's a bit wonky, right? But what one thing you need to bear in mind is that today, a lot of the way academic funding works sort of centers usually on the notion of there being some bit of hardware or capital equipment that you're buying. And as we know, like that stuff depreciates faster than cars. It's like the worst thing to buy. If you're a researcher in an academic institution, you'd be much better placed to buy like a cloud computing sort of credit or system system that lets you access a variety of different clouds. We're generally, when we go and work with governments, um, pushing this idea that they should fund some kind of credit that backs on to a bunch of different cloud systems, because you don't want a government saying, all right, all of America is going to run on like Amazon's cloud. That's obviously like a bad idea, but you can probably create a, a credit which backs on to the infrastructures of like five or six large cloud entities and deal with the competitive concerns that way. And I think that this is surprisingly tractable. It's like some, some policy ideas are relatively simple because they don't need to be any more complicated. And so we're kind of lobbying, for lack of a better word, governments to do this. Uh, I think the other thing to bear in mind is that lots of governments, because they've invested in supercomputers, really want to use supercomputers as their compute solution for academia. And that mostly doesn't work. You actually mostly need a dumber, simpler form of hardware for most forms of experimentation. So you're also saying to governments, like, I know you spent all of this money on this supercomputer and it's wonderful. And yeah, it's great at simulating nuclear weapons and weather. We love that. You don't need it for this. Stop trying to use it for this, like, exclusively. <laughs> so that's also where some of that comes from. Nice. Um, I actually have not <laughs> encountered that. That's an interesting uh, observation. Well, look, if, if, you're, if you're like the US, right, you're like, we've spent untold billions on like having the winner of the top 500 list. And we're in some pitched <laughs> geopolitical war with China. Like, of course, we want to use this for AI. Um, and you're like, yeah, dude, but like some people just want like an eight GPU server. <laughs> Actually, most people are fine with that. So you re and this thing is not like easy to like multiplex and sample out to people compared to like AWS or, or Microsoft or whatever. Um, interesting. Well, we so um, we're a little bit running out of time, and I also yeah. I'm curious about. We always end with two questions. Um, mm -hmm. that I'm particularly interested in in your point of view on this. So, um, yeah, the first one. I mean, and you actually you really view a lot of things going on in AI, I mean, from your vantage point at, at OpenAI and then also the, the newsletter that you put out. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you say is like the topic that people don't pay enough attention to? Like the the thing that like, you know, is just matters so much more than people um, compared to yeah. the, how much people look at it. I think the thing that no one looks at that really matters is advances in just a very niche part of computer vision which is the problem of re-identification of an object or a person that you've seen previously. And what I mean is that our ability to do pedestrian re-identification now is, is improving significantly. It's stacked on all of these ImageNet sort of innovations. It's stacked on our ability to do rapid like feature extraction from video feeds. It's stacked on like a load of just interesting component innovations. And it's creating this stream of technologies that will lead to really, really cheap surveillance that eventually is deployable on edge systems like drones or whatever by anyone. And I think that we're kind of 
massively underestimating the effects of that capability because it's not that interesting, it's not that advanced, it doesn't even require like massively complex like reinforcement learning or any of these things that researchers like to spend time on. It's just a sort of basic component. But that is the component that supports surveillance states and authoritarianism. And that is the component that can make it very easy for an otherwise sort of liberal government to slip into a form of surveillance and control that no one would really want to have. Um, and I, I'm actually thinking about, yeah, can I write like a survey or something about this? Because it's not helpful for someone like OpenAI to warn of this, and it's sort of a wrong message. It's maybe okay for me to write about it occasionally in my newsletter as I do, but I sort of think about writing an essay like, has anyone noticed this? Because like, <laughs> like, I gather all of the, the scores, right? I look at all of the graphs and stuff, I've got this big like, folder of it. It's all going up, like it's all going hockey stick, it's all getting cheap. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's not very cheerful, but I think it's important, yeah. Wow, great answer as expected. Um, all right, here's my second question, which we always ask, and, and you know, normally we're, in, we're we're talking to kind of more industry practitioners, but mm -hmm. maybe you can apply this to OpenAI. So when you look at the DML projects that you've witnessed, and like OpenAI has actually had some really spectacular ones, mm -hmm. um, what's the like what's the part of sort of like um, conception to to complete that looks the hardest to you, or maybe the the most unexpectedly difficult? Um, piece of it, like sort of watching, um, you know, like solving Dota or being the best yeah, human yeah. at Dota, or like GP2, like what, like where do things get stuck and and um, and why? Good question. Um, I think that there are maybe two parts where projects get like stuck or or have interesting traits. One is just data. Like I, I used to really want data to not matter so much. And then you just look at it and realize that, you know, whether it's like Dota and how you ingest data from like the game engine there or robotics and how you choose to do like domain randomization and simulation or, or supervised learning where you're just figuring out what data sets I have and what, what mixing proportion do I give them during training and how many runs do I do? That just seems very hard. And I think others have talked about this. It's not really a well-documented science. It's something that many people treat with intuition and it just seems like an easy place to get stuck. And then the other is testing. Once I have a system, how well can I characterize it? And, and what sort of tests can I use from the existing research literature? And what tests do I need to sort of build myself? Like we, we spend a lot of time thinking about new evaluations at OpenAI because for some systems, you want to do a form of eval that doesn't yet exist to characterize performance in some domain. And figuring out how to test for a performance trait that may not even be present in a system is really hard. It's a really, really difficult question. So those would be the two areas, yeah. Okay, I can't help myself actually. As you were talking, I, I thought of like all one right. more question. That yeah, I've watched all, I'm sorry to do this, but I've, I've watched yeah. so like, I feel like the people that I know or that I've like watched closely at OpenAI have been actually spectacularly successful, and and like you know they've been part of projects that have really um, seemed to me have succeeded, like the the robot hand doing the Rubik's mm -hmm. cube and and um, and Dota. Are there like a whole bunch of products that or, or projects that we don't see that have just totally failed? Oh, we've got failures. I don't know if you remember Universe. That was sort of a, a failure. We tried to like. We tried to build a system which was kind of like opening eye gym, but the environments would be every flash and HTML game that had been published on the internet. Oh, and yeah, then, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So that failed, right? Uh, that failed because of network asynchronicity. And so basically you ended up having, because we were sandboxing with things in a browser and you had a separate game engine that needed to go and talk over the network to them, RL actually isn't really robust enough to that level of like time jitter to do useful stuff. So that kind of didn't work. Um, uh -huh. So we have some public failures, which I think is, is kind of helpful. <laughs> yeah, we have some some kind of private ones. A lot of it is, you know, some people just spend a year or two on an idea but ends up not working out. Um, some people, and I won't name the project because it's public, but they, they, they came up with a simple thing that worked really well. And they spent six months trying to come up with what as a researcher they thought was the more disciplined or like better approach to it. 
and the simple thing always worked and all of the other things they tried didn't. So they eventually published a system with like the simple <laughs> thing. And they were like, yeah, it works, but I don't, I, I would much rather like my complex idea works. Um, but we don't, like our big bets, like the hand or, or Dota or GPT, those have tended to go okay. But that's usually because they've come from a place of iteration. Like Dota came from prior work applying uh, PPO and I think evolutionary algorithms to, to other systems. The hand came from prior work on just like block rotation, right? So once you can do block rotation, you can do a Rubik's. GPT came from prior work on scaling up language models just in GPT-1. So a lot of it's just happened sort of iteratively in the public domain. Hmm. But yeah, we cool. don't have like, we don't have an abnormal lack of failure nor an abnormal amount of success. I think I think it's just like, it's pretty it's pretty in distribution. I hope. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks. That was that was really fun. <laughs> All right. Thanks very that, much. That great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. All right. See you um, later. Cool. All right. See you, man.